Our next guest is Raymond Gator. Raymond Gator is an Australian philosopher and award-winning writer. He was, up until 2011, Foundation Professor of Philosophy at the Australian Catholic University and Professor of Moral Philosophy at King's College London. He is currently professorial, professorial Fellow in the Melbourne Law School and the Faculty of Arts, but he's come across to VU tonight, so they've let him out. <laughs> His bib bibliography is astounding. Of course, you know him as the writer of Romulus, My Father. He's written many books, Value and Understanding, Essays for Peter Winch, Good and Evil and Absolute Conception, A Common Humanity, Thinking About Love and Truth and Justice, The Philosopher's Dog, published back in 2002, Why the War Was Wrong in 2003, Breach of Trust, Truth, Morality and Politics, Good and Evil and Absolute Conception, Gaza, Morality, Law and Politics, Essays on Muslims and Multiculturalism, Singing for All His Worth, Essays in Honour of J.G. Rosenberg, and of course culminating in the last book that I know of, After Romulus. Raymond Gator has been to Rotunda three times and it's an immense privilege to have him back. He was here in early this year with Bob Murphy and we talked about moral and physical courage and it was one of our wacky ideas, well one of Raymond's, Ray, I should call him Ray, he tells me to call him Ray now. Helen Garner says of Romulus, my father, to change the literary air in this country. Come and taste the man who changed the literary air, Mr Raymond Gator. Oh, well, I'm very pleased to be here again uh, uh, at, R at Rotunda. I've uh, always joined, enjoyed being here, and particularly tonight with such distinguished company. Uh, where else uh, could I have had a conversation with Bob Murphy, that classy, courageous Western Bulldogs footballer, <laughs> and a member of the All-Australian team? Uh, this is what I wrote to Bruno after that conversation uh, earlier this year. I quote, it was one of the best public conversations in which I've taken part. All my family loved it, but the conversation was genuinely between the three of us, and I've no doubt that's why it worked so well and why so many people appeared to be touched by it. It's rare for people in your position to work as hard preparing for the evening. Not only did you read all the necessary books and interviews, and in Bob's case, his columns, but you think with great sensitivity about what to do with the results of your research in order to engage with tactful penetration what matters most to the people you've invited to share the stage with you. That, at any rate, has been my experience on all the occasions I've come to Rotunda, and who can resist your warmth? End of quote. I feel, though, a bit of a fraud here this evening, uh, you know, because in the title for the event, My Enduring Love Affair with Writing, uh, the word writing takes a capital W for reasons other than the fact that it's in the title. I'm not a writer with a capital W. I mean that, I'm not being coy. I'm often appalled by the clumsiness of my prose, but when my efforts to ameliorate that are even partially successful, they don't yield for me pleasure of a kind a writer takes, by definition I'm inclined to say, in a well-constructed sentence. A dear friend, the poet and essayist Peter Steele, who died recently, wrote a wonderful essay called Poetry as the Mind in Love. You can read it in his collection uh, called Braiding the Voices, Essays in Poetry. The title of his essay could be generalized to writing, as the mind in love, in love, of course, with language. I'm not that kind of lover. It's true that I've said to my wife, Yale, and to some friends, but never publicly, that I wish I could write poetry. But one reason I know that I never could is just because I'm not that kind of lover. I'd like to write poetry, not because I'd like to create poems in which I and others could delight, but because I believe that if I could write good poetry, it would make my sensibility, make me more adequate to the wondrous complexity and beauty of the world. I must confess, though, that for someone who's not a writer, the impulse to write came early and in a polemical voice. In 1956 or 57, when I was 10 or 11, I wrote my first book, self-published, of course, in paperback. School exercises don't come in hardback. 
with photographs even. I don't remember its title exactly, but it was something like Elvis Presley, De Devil or Hero. <laughs> it was a defense of Elvis against those who called his music devil music and was inspired by hearing, hearing him sing Baby Let's Play House. It had quite an impact on my, its sole reader, my father. He told me he wanted never to see it again <laughs> and even threatened to tear it up. The polemical impulse continued into my university years, but its reception didn't improve. Of an article I wrote as an undergraduate, a student reviewer wrote something like the following in Farago. Quote, my pretty much a quote. Following Sartre, Gator distinguishes beings that are things in themselves from beings that are things for themselves. But if you ask me, the whole thing is up itself. <laughs> And when I wrote over 50 columns for Robert Mann's Quadrant, readers complained to Rob every month, saying that they couldn't understand a word I wrote. <laughs> One of them, though, must have got the hang of the structure of my admittedly long sentences, because he wrote a letter to the editor in which he said, I quote, each month I wait with masochistic anticipation <laughs> for the arrival of Quadrant to see what new barbarities Raymond Gator has perpetrated <laughs> on the English language, <laughs> end of quote. But judging by the hate mail and hostile telephone calls <laughs> I got when I wrote about the injustices against our indigenous peoples, a lot of readers understood me only too well. Uh, would I now uh, spoil a good story if I say that in I indulged revengeful wishes fulfilled, albeit with a sense of irony, when The Economist, just the kind of magazine my quadrant critics read with respect, nominated A Common Humanity, which included revised versions of some of the quadrant essays, as one of the best books of 2000. I thought, well, there you are. Nonetheless, you'll understand, I think, why when some people urged me to write about my father and our life together in central Victoria, I replied that while there might be, might be a good story there, I wasn't the person to write it. Well, I did write it. The intensity of the experience of writing the first draft in only three weeks came second only to the intensity of falling in love with Yael, though in the case of writing Romulus, the experience was, was of exhilaration, alternating with depression. When it was published, things changed dramatically. People called me a writer. I was invited to writers' festivals. Always I sincerely protested that I'm not a writer, and always people thought I couldn't really mean it. I don't want to leave you with a wrong impression about my attitude to language. I don't think of it as being merely an instrument for, of communication for our thoughts, in my case, more or less philosophical thoughts. The late English philosopher Bernard Williams tells the possibly apocryphal story of two philosophers writing a book together. One says to the other, let's first get the content right, then you can add the style. Conceived this way, style connects to content only in so far as it gives a clear expression. For the rest, it's adornment, sometimes pleasing, sometimes irritating, but often suspect because on this account, it appeals to feeling rather than to thought. The idea that informs that conception of the relations between style and content is that we should try to put anything that is genuinely cognitive, genuinely a matter for thought and understanding, in a form to which the objection that it's sentimental or cliched or shows a teeny of irony would be as inappropriate as it would be to lodge such an objection to a proposition in physics or mathematics. Real thought, thought directed at understanding, according to this way of thinking, of what it is to be obedient to the voice of reason, strives to exist in a kind of tone-free zone. Well, in my writing, I've been critical of this way of thinking about what it is really to seek understanding, but it's a way of thinking that goes very deep in Western culture. I've elaborated and defended a conception of thought and understanding in which head and heart are inseparably combined. In books like The Philosopher's Dog and After Romulus, I've tried to practice what I preach. An experiment in narrative philosophy, the philosopher Roger Scruton called The Philosopher's Dog, and the same might be said of some of the essays in After Romulus. Though my books are of different kinds, 
the philosopher uh, is evident in all of them, I think, even in Romulus, my father. True, I'm regarded as a maverick, as a philosopher and as an academic. In books like A Common Humanity, The Philosopher's Dog, and in some of the essays in After Romulus, I've wanted to write to what I take to be a lay audience, educated and prepared to think hard, an audience that doesn't assume that if one has to read a sentence twice, it must be the fault of the author. But when I write for such people, it's not to introduce them to philosophy or to make philosophy simple and accessible to them. I assume they're already thinking more or less philosophical thoughts. Who, after all, doesn't have an opinion on whether truth is absolute or relative and is therefore morality? So I hope to say to them without a trace of condescension, I know the technical difficulties in the discipline. I know the gap that exists between what a good, honest paper on these subjects would look like and most discussions of them in literary magazines and in other non-academic media. But let's see how far we can go together, thinking together, before we reach the kinds of difficulties that are appreciated only by someone who's immersed in the discipline. I also hope that those writings contribute to the discipline. I want to speak to the discipline as well as to the general reader and in one and the same book. How I could even hope to do that is something I don't have time to explain this evening. Though I've been a severe critic of the universities and of the academic practice of philosophy and other disciplines, the academy matters profoundly to me. That's where many of the bright young people go, and I want to be there with them, to speak with them about the treasures that could be theirs, which are their rightful inheritance, but which are these days all too often denied them. And for that reason, I want it next year to begin to write, I've been thinking about this for years, a book which, if anything I wrote, deserved to be called a magnum opus, would be it. At its center will be a conception of morality of a kind that I've developed in other works. And in one direction, it'll go via moral psychology and evolutionary theory to a philosophy of nature. And in the other direction, to a philosophy of law and politics. Before that, though, I intend to write a different book of an altogether different kind, the kind of book that really does give me great pleasure to write. It'll be a book celebrating people, friends and teachers, who have mattered profoundly to me in my life. Thank you. I thought it was a really wonderful evening, and uh, the reason that it was, because everybody was so good, and delivered such wonderful uh, pieces. And the reason they did, I'm absolutely sure, is for Bruno and for Rotunda. Uh, it was a very special occasion. Uh, of such high standard and quality.